exciting for me to, to participate in this discussion. My uh, first uh, in, encounter, perhaps, with the uh, with an Indian perspective was uh, when I was with Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, attending the WIPO Standing Committee on Copyright uh, ne negotiations around uh, the Broadcast Treaty, and uh, the Indian delegation uh, was uh, a very strong proponent that copyright did not need to be strengthened uh, rather than simply falling behind the flock of uh, the United States and EU broadcasters who were demanding new rights. Um, India was uh, standing up for the interests of its uh, end users, its consumers, and uh, its participants in the process who had uh, different interests. Uh, and I think uh, that it's important to uh, continue to think about uh, how interests differ, and I've heard a lot of uh, that, uh, that thinking about uh, r reflecting interests and deep thought uh, in the two days of conference here. Um, on the point, I want to speak a bit to the, the point of internet exceptionalism, and uh, the exception that I see in the internet uh, is that everything is intermediated, that there is no way to talk directly to uh, someone else uh, with electronic resources except by going through uh, an intermediary. Uh, and so that means that the intermediaries are affecting all of our uh, individual communications. Uh, the internet has brought to us sort of tremendous uh, growth in our ability to communicate. Uh, we've seen it lower a lot of the transaction costs of uh, reaching out for personal communications, for business uh, development, for uh, innovation, uh, and that has enabled uh, what my Berkman colleague Yochai Benkler refers to as uh, peer production, uh, a, a, a new model of uh, development that's not the, the capitalist or the uh, hierarchical development of information, but uh, peers coming together with this low-cost, high-speed communication medium to build things together, perhaps motivated from the love of editing an online encyclopedia like Wikipedia, perhaps motivated by the uh, sheer interest in figuring out how a new piece of open source software can serve their needs. Uh, and uh, from this, great economic value is built, but also great social and cultural value uh, enabled by uh, these uh, low-cost, uh, no permission required uh, architectures uh, of the internet. And, and so looking at those examples of peer-created archives of material of media licensed under Creative Commons licenses, uh, free for the sharing, um, I want to urge uh, again uh, that we uh, avoid the temptation to use the intermediaries as choke points uh, because choke points can stop that valuable uh, social, cultural, economic activity. Uh, imposing transaction costs may cut off a lot of that uh, valuable uh, individual and societal development. Uh, intermediaries can uh, be forced by the threat of liability uh, to infringe on privacy, on individual autonomy, uh, on free expression, on uh, innovation and uh, creativity. Uh, and since sort of what, what intermediaries do affects us as individuals, uh, forcing them to, to reshape the network of our communications uh, in the name of being able to better block uh, whatever is the uh, sort of current hot button issue will leave us with a net that is less flexible um, and less able to deliver to us sort of the next great unexpected benefit. Um, and so I think uh, India internet can be a home for innovation, uh, a home for the creative industry uh, that I see here, uh, a home for uh, creative uh, cultural production, um, and I'd urge, uh, leave it that flexibility uh, to develop those individual interests.
Thank you uh, very much, um, Professor Satcha. And uh, I will just add to one the point you said. You know, I I think that was a um, expression which will get a lot of us thinking. Choke point and to use the intermediary as a choke point. And uh, I'm just going to raise this from a from an India perspective. Most suits sometimes i can't say most i'll be wrong in saying sometimes suits are filed or actions are brought against an intermediary simply because an intermediary is available the initial infringer or the initial author of let us say a defamatory content may not be traceable immediately that tracing of course takes the perspective of a section 91 notice the police investigation getting your uh, ip address then zeroing down to some village in, in some remote area and identifying oh this is sajan pawaya who has put it up now, ultimately, surgeon may get sued, but immediately the intermediary is available and therefore let's go and sue the intermediary and get at least interim orders of protection. If sometimes we have found that intermediaries are sued simply because they are immediately available and they tend, therefore, probably these actions tend to choke the intermediary and, and I'll leave that um, at that and, and of course, again, request um, Justice Butt to give his perspective on, on the fact as to, you know, would he from within the judiciary you know, does he see the fact that intermediaries are sometimes targeted simply because they are prominently available whilst the uh, initial or the original infringer may not be easily available? Uh, on that point, of course, the uh, person to my extreme left, so that's uh, Professor Sutton, and I'd like to, you know, receive your views on this aspect. All right. Well, I hope this is uh, reasonably logical. I've scribbled down a lot of thoughts here of... Um, things have been through my head the last couple of days. Um, where this falls in the right-left spectrum, I don't know, I'm, I don't consider myself a free market capitalist. So uh, according to the, uh, the online political matrix, I'm libertarian left somewhere in the region of Mahatma Gandhi, it told me. So I don't know if this is reflected in that or not. Uh, first thing that has occurred to me actually the last couple of days is um, how great it is that you have two of your eminent judges have been involved. Um, these two days because a lot of the major problems we've had with difficulties in the law in this area and in regulating the internet generally have come about because uh, those deciding the cases and those in parliament quite often just don't understand the technology. So it's great to see that some of your guys are really getting to grips with this stuff and um, I think it's essential that those of you who really have a grasp of these legal issues uh, get out there and lobby and influence because you can bet the people who want to uh, maybe control things in a way that you don't like will be out there lobbying for their interests. Um, secondly, I think looking at this area, the, um, it's really important before we regulate at the intermediary level to think realistically about what's actually the problem. We had a lot of moral panic in the West and we've had a lot of new laws that have been brought in in response to oh no, there are naked people on the internet, our kids will see them and grow up and become rapists. So we rush to regulate because uh, out of fear and out of perceived uh, the um, clean feed blocking system I mentioned yesterday, all kinds of big claims that they block 3,000 hits at child pornography a day. Well, they claimed that in 2006, but I, it, as it is explained to me by people who are real tackies, when you break that down, um, any one page, if it's particularly content rich, every time you look at that, that could be 800 hits. And by the time you work through all of that, this was not the way it was represented by the press as 3,000 perverts trying to look at naked kids a day. That also means those were websites that Clean Feed chose to block that they were looking for, not necessarily uh, things that were actually child pornography, as we've discovered. Um, seems to me the likelihood is that some form of liability at the intermediary level is likely. It's probable, and I personally think there are justifiable circumstances where that can be done. Um, however, if you are going to look at how we've done it in Europe, if you are going to look at how it's been done in the US, learn from our mistakes. Look at where we've screwed up, where we've uh, overshot liability, where we've put... Um, Quite often, I think, in, in both countries, you end up with an ISP having to make a difficult call. Now, there are two sides to that. Either you get, there's the argument about chilling effects, as, as Wendy's put it, where 
um, and ISP thinks, oh bugger, I'd better get rid of this stuff just in case I end up liable, and they might be cutting out a lot of perfectly legitimate speech there. Equally on the flip side, you have to ask the question, do we really want an intermediary necessarily being the one to make a decision as to whether my content should come down or not? There's a, an accountability question there, again, as there is with the blocking, where they're making legal decisions it occurs to me. Um, I'm intrigued, uh, just another thing I've noticed over the last couple of days, that the uh, counter to the normal pattern I've experienced, it's we uh, older people, if I dare put it that way, who've been around a little longer, who've been sort of expressing some more liberal thoughts, and a lot of the students have been quite <laughs> full-on father bear mode. Um, I think you might want to rethink maybe some of that, but I gather the last thing you cover in your degree is consumer protection, so when you look at it from the other side of the fence, you might start to think that maybe strict liability isn't necessarily a fair thing to do. <coughs> Certainly, the danger is uh, if you're trying to stimulate that the, the intermediary aspect of the internet economy in India, that if you over-regulate and overburden them, you just will find that industry doesn't grow withers because of overregulation. People, uh, international companies won't want to come and set up a base here. Google pulled out of China. Um, well, they, I mean, the official reason was because they, they were hacking us, but a major part of that seems to me be because of the criticism from outside, but also the fact that they discovered that kind of regulation was a bit more of a pain in the bum than they thought it was going to be. It was a real uh, burden to do that, both in terms of actually facilitating it and in terms of the criticism they got for it. So bear that in mind in terms of the uh, the industry. Um, um, I mean, in terms of uh, yeah, looking looking at the US and the UK, it's uh, just because we did it first doesn't mean we did it right. Uh, Arthur Miller, the uh, American playwright, once said he'd rather be treated by the most ordinary medical graduate than by Hippocrates himself. And there's a lot of wisdom in that that could be applied here. Um, to see. I mean, so the, the main overall point, I think, to make is that um, this notion of whether or not the intermediary should be liable, how do we make them liable, in what circumstances do we have one standard EU style model for all unlawful third party content, do we treat it differently in different styles the way they've done in the US. The main thing is to remember that intermediary liability is not the silver bullet, it's not the magic cure that will sort out everything, it's part of the picture. Um, but we've also got all our regulation at the source, we might also be going to the market as in some cases we've done in the UK by criminalising possession of certain material, but it's part of a wider picture. It may even be, but well, certainly will be part of a wider picture as well in terms of uh, regulation by law, but also how do, what do we do on a practical basis. The Internet Watch Foundation in the UK for a long time has operated with the internet industry and the police. Uh, now. I'm not necessarily a fan of what they've done with the blocking, but in terms of identifying where material exists online and reporting that to the police for them then to try and take action, and the police have this understanding with the ISPs that, OK, you've reported us what appears to be child porn. Work with us and we'll try and see if we can put this through the proper channels rather than necessarily you know, having a stick to beat the ISP with in that context. I think that's... Um, got to be part of the overall picture too, so do it, but do it in context. And don't do it badly just because we did it badly. I think that's loosely everything at the minute. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Setup. Uh, you know, I think, you know, what I said kind of aligns so much with what you did in terms of uh, I don't think as a country, and I'll repeat that, I don't think as a country we should look at our, the growth of our jurisprudence in this area vis-a-vis -vis what happened in the US and the UK. You know, it's not that we need 10, or we should take 10 precedents of what happened there and try and find some sort of a path within it. I think there is this, this real urgent need for ground up thought process. I'm not saying that we will come to a different conclusion vis-a-vis -vis what the West has come, but a ground up thought process on this is, is very much needed. 
But I'll make one reaction to what uh, Professor Sata said before I move to Justice uh, Button and request him to speak. Uh, is that, you know, you said that most problems have arisen in this area uh, because uh, often uh, legislatures or uh, judges have not understood technology when uh, these decisions have come about and, and uh, there is a, a, an element of truth to that. But as a litigator, and, and the reaction I'm making comes from my own experience as a litigator over the last few years,